here, I think, is, is, is quite, quite brief in the sense that it's a, it's a subpart of, of what you've been hearing about Jeff, you were out when I, when I said thank you. That's right. Uh, of, of what you've heard about the complexity of Chiari malformation uh, of, and how we look at it and how we treat it. And I'm here really to, to, to wave the flag of CSF disorders, which are things like hydrocephalus, increased fluid pressure, intracranial hypertension, and CSF leaks and hypotension and cysts. These CSF disorders uh, are really related disorders to Chiari. And, and indeed, in some, in, some, in some in many cases, Chiari is a CSF disorder. And I think the CSF, uh, the foundation knows this because amazingly the acronym is CSF. So we, there's, there's, that was maybe not a coincidence. So uh, we know that there's that's this strong relationship. Uh, these are, I have no disclosures for this talk, and I don't need to introduce Chiari to you, except to say that this simplistic way of looking at it as a malformation, uh, small posterior fossa perhaps, uh, uh, can sometimes lead us astray in terms of how we treat and think about the disease. We know, those of us who see many people with Chiari, that people come in with some descent of their, their tonsils, maybe similar amount, but the rest of the context of the Chiari is very different, whether the, the size of the canal, the dynamics, the size of the ventricles, and so forth, uh, and syrinxes, and so forth. These are very different disorders. One of these is symptomatic, and one is not, and it may not be the one that you think. So the simple way to think about uh, Chiari is the way that, well, I don't know me, uh, all neurosurgeons, but I as a neurosurgeon like to think congenital anomaly impacted frame in Monroe. Let's do a decompression because that's causing the symptoms. It's kind of a simplistic way uh, of looking at it. But when you really look at it and see many people with Chiari, you realize that there's many uncertainties in each of these steps, uh, that there's uh, dynamics, craniospinal dynamics, I'm calling them skeletal mo mobility, uh, fluid dynamics, which is what we'll really be talking about here for the most part, and brain and tissue, elasticity and so forth, which play a role in how much uh, impacting of the, of the tonsils, how much crowding there may, there may be, and what effect it may have. Uh, is the Chiari caused by compression? As, for example, a small posterior fossa, is it caused by bending and twisting? Uh, are things being pushed down by fluid pressure above, that would be a hydrocephalus, or a cyst, or masses? Is it being pulled down uh, by a, a fluid leak and low pressures, or a tethered core? These are all different forces, different kinds of uh, effects, which can all lead uh, to crowding of the cervical medullary junction. I'm going to talk a little bit about cardiovascular pulsatile CSF motion as a possible contributor to this as well. And then, once we have pictures like we've, we've seen, we've all seen of compressed uh, cervical medullary junctions, once we've seen uh, tonsils smashed against the spinal cord, uh, we realize that many of these people are, are not symptomatic. Sometimes it's incidentally found. Sometimes there's been mi very minimal, if any, uh, symptoms, and sometimes it's very symptomatic. What, what causes the symptoms? Uh, if it was just the compression that we're looking at on our images, uh, then, uh, then it would be a, a simpler thing to, to see, even on the pictures. But is it the compression? Is there some aspect of the obstruction of CSF movement itself and pressure changes that result? Is it movement of tissues, as has been uh, uh, speculated by some in terms of uh, hyperflexibility, in terms of just, just the movement of the spinal cord and, and the brainstem? Uh, obviously, the comorbidities, including the syrinx, uh, would, would play a role in how, how symptomatic uh, the patient is, and what is the role of other aspects such as inflammatory diseases and different inflammatory states and chronic pain. So to go from the, the basic crowding to true impaction and, and, and problems, is it a problem in blood flow and so forth, and then to go to symptoms, there's many steps and many different types of Chiari that could be classified based on, on these variations. And this, of course, uh, can bring about problems in patient selection and in failed operations. So our, our Chiari founding fathers, as, as was briefly alluded to also by, uh, by Jeff and what we just heard, uh, many of them uh, looked at CSF as being, uh, having a primary role in the cause, in the etiology of the, of the, the earlier, the congenital Chiari malformation in its development. Uh, Gardner as a, as a, as a, push, as a pushing downward uh, of the uh, posterior fossa uh, and uh, creating a syrinx uh, in a, what he, he called a water hammer type effect. Williams was more of a, a sucking down uh, due to a ball valve effect, the, the lower pressure in the spinal cord sucking down the, the, uh, the cerebellar tonsils. And uh, McClone also had a hypothesis for uh, Chiari II malformation, myelin meningocele, in which the whole herniation of the, uh, of the uh, cerebellum and the tonsils was caused by 
early CSF leak and low pressures in the spinal canal. So, so CSF pressure uh, movement uh, and uh, obstructions have played a, a, a prominent role in our thinking about Chiari malformation even from the early years. But how do we go uh, in a patient by patient basis and, and also just in, in our thinking about Chiari from congenital malformations and cervical metroid crowding uh, to symptom uh, development and progression? Well, I'm here to kind of convince you that CSF uh, should be thought of uh, in, in all of these cases and, and should be part of our screening process, which I think you, what you've already heard uh, here today already. Uh, and let's see if I get the, yep. Going a little bit too fast. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is, uh, is basically what we might call high pressure CSF problems. And that would be a buildup of fluid in the ventricular system. There's obstructive hydrocephalus, uh, which builds up fluid up, up top and pushes uh, the posterior fossa down. Uh, there's also general intracranial hypertension. You've heard it spoken about several times. And uh, we're gonna talk about some of the ways that that might uh, cause uh, crowding at the cervical medullary junction, or at least some, show some cases of that. Uh, and things like cysts or other forms of masses. Uh, the causes. So this is one of the, I guess, uh, the simplest uh, to, to conceive of, of, a, of a CSF interaction with Chiari malformation. In other words, the fluid pressure, pressure from above, whether contained in a ventricle or an assist, or just generally is pushing down and causing uh, the crowding. So uh, here you see some examples. On the, on the left, you see a, uh, what is really an obstructive hydrocephalus, but the obstructions at the bottom of that fourth ventricle and I don't know if I can do that. This is a new pointer that you point to the computer. Let's see if it works. Yeah, so obviously there's a blockage uh, and you see the Chiari malformation down here, but it is due in part and to great extent by pressure from the lateral ventricles up there, the third ventricle and down in a very much enlarged fourth ventricle. On the other side, you see, I, this is actually pretty cool. Uh, you see it, that there is a Chiari malformation down past the C1 and crowding and even a syrinx developed in the spinal cord. And there's also cysts that form that can be part of the crowding uh, that causes the Chiari. The general, the general feeling in most of these situations, and I wouldn't mind hearing comments from the uh, other uh, caregivers and neurosurgeons here, uh, is to treat the, treat the hydrocephalus first. If you don't do that, very likely you're going to have continued pressure downward and, and you won't have a successful uh, treatment. You might even have something that is worse. Uh, there are some situations, and I'll show you another situation in a moment, in which you might conceive of, of treating the Chiari. And I actually have treated uh, a Chiari in, in the face of what we think is uh, posterior fossa uh, outflow obstruction, uh, fourth ventricular outflow obstruction. Uh, but for the most part, uh, the principle is to treat the hydrocephalus first. John. You just treat the arachnoid cysts there without doing a suboccipital decompression. What's that? The right case. Yes. Did you just do? Did you just it, just penetrate the arachnoid cysts? You didn't. It, like no, in this in this situation, you would do both. You would you would go in, it, but you should make sure that you do open up the arachnoid cyst. I guess would be the point there that you treat the cyst portion at the same time. This is a patient who presented uh, to us for. Uh, Chiari evaluation and was recommended for a uh, Chiari decompression. But when we looked and we saw, we had to remember that uh, Chiari can be a CSF uh, disorder. And when we looked into the eyes, we saw papilledema. And this patient had idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Uh, indeed, when we looked at the veins in the back, the transverse sinuses, there were blockages which increased the venous pressure throughout the brain, causing the uh, pseudotumor cerebri. And we did stenting, as was, was mentioned previously. And we wanted to treat that first because the patient was in danger of blindness at the time, although there was certainly symptomatic, uh, there certainly was a symptomatic Chiari malformation. Uh, there was a, a tuss of cough, there was, there was problems of pain in the posterior part of the head and neck and so forth. Uh, well, when we did that, uh, we actually, uh, I, I hope you can see it, but there's actually some elevation, uh, some improvement in the Chiari itself. We, we stented the transverse sinuses, uh, the pressure came down, the tonsils came up slightly, and we have several other examples of this as well, and, and the syrinx even started resolving. This was only uh, about four, four or five weeks after uh, the uh, stenting, but we found that both based on the pictures and the patient's symptoms, that a Chiari decompression uh, was something we actually never did, and we followed this patient longer term, and they continued to be uh, resolved and uh, uh, without progression of the syrinx. So, uh, Here's a patient that could have had a Chiari decompression, and we're glad that we classified this in another way, and we're able to treat the basic cause. 
So here's a, a, a approximately 50 year old woman who came in with very severe head and neck pain. She was very much restricted in her movement, had some imbalance in part because of that pain. Uh, she had some episodes of confusion, but was actually uh, neurologically otherwise intact, with the exception of some right hand tingling. As you can see, there is a CSF disorder. Well, first of all, you see a large fourth ventricle. The aqueduct here is open, so there's not obstruction. But there may be, and likely is, some obstruction at the cervical medullary junction. Large, and I don't show it here, but large lateral ventricles as well, third ventricle and fourth ventricle. There's also a very impressive syrinx uh, that was over the entire uh, cervical cord. Uh, again, the basic principle was to treat the hydrocephalus first. And the, the shunting, does this work? No. Uh, the uh, shunting brought the ventricles down dramatically. And within the, the next week, uh, the, the patient's symptoms resolved pretty much 98%. There was a little bit of tingling she had left in her hands. Uh, and she, of course, we knew her to have still this syrinx. And we had scheduled her for a Chiari operation. And she actually said, well, geez, I feel fine now. Should I do the Chiari decompression? And I said, wonder, should we, should we, she felt real fine. Should we do the Chiari decompression? Or should we wait? Sorry, I was writing down. That, that's okay. That's okay. Well, we were in this dilemma. Would John, would you do the Chiari decompression? No. No. We, I have to say, there's long discussion. We ended up doing it mainly because of the severity of her syrinx. However, uh, uh, let's see. Oh. I don't know what I've done here. Sorry. I want to go backwards. Let's do that. Yeah. Uh, we ended up doing it because of the severity of things, but, but that may not have been the right thing in that she was doing quite well. Could it be that with resolution of the ventricular megaly that the fourth ventricle outflow would indeed open up and uh, it might even affect the syrinx? Uh, so that is a possibility. And these are the, the kind of uh, considerations and conflicts that, we are, that we're in as we're trying to, to, try to manage two things here, the hydrocephalus and the, and the syrinx and the Chiari malformation. Uh, she continues to do very well uh, after the Chiari decompression, however. This patient uh, is an illustration of, of some of the difficulties in managing patients with Chiari malformation and shunted hydrocephalus. This patient has had uh, hydrocephalus uh, all her life, essentially, she's congenital hydrocephalus, and has uh, what we consider small or even slit ventricles. What was impressed me about this patient is she has been in and out of the emergency room. Uh, for example, the last several months she was in and out, uh, spending relatively, according to her mother, half her time in the ERs with headaches, which were being watched. She was given steroids, tried to get over uh, her episode of headache. Uh, this is not unusual for patients with, with small ventricles trying to drain evenly uh, when the ventricles are really small. Slip ventricle syndrome is one of our most difficult things to manage. What we have found with this patient and with other patients uh, is that uh, if there's a Chiari uh, uh, present, uh, then often the hydrocephalus is a very sensitive one. In other words, very small changes in CSF drainage uh, can affect this patient. And indeed, uh, the last time that this patient came in, uh, we found that she went into bradycardia several times. She ended up in an intensive care unit. Uh, and we ended up doing a revision, and a, a, a Chiari decompression is actually not done yet, but we plan to do that uh, in the sense that we found that if there, is a, if there is not a Chiari uh, obstruction of CSF, then the hydrocephalus becomes much less uh, sensitive and difficult uh, to manage. I'm not sure that's, that's the root of uh, much other slip ventricle syndrome uh, problems, but uh, yeah, I think it is in many cases. This is a, a nine-year-old child who had a similar issue. He, was, he came to us where they said every time he has a shunt problem, he ends up in the intensive care unit with bradycardia, he's, his mental status goes down, he's very sensitive to any shunt change, and indeed he had small ventricles. And again, here you see he also has uh, the Chiari malformation. But when we looked at the history, we also found out that to treat those that difficult to treat slip ventricles where putting a catheter in the ventricles on top becomes very difficult. Uh, they placed a lumbar shunt. And when I look back at the pictures before the lumbar shunt, we can see that this was actually six to eight months before uh, 
the uh, MRI in the middle, and here you see there was no Chiari malformation before the lumbar shunt was placed. Now, this is nothing new in the sense that we know that we shunt patients from below. There can be descent of the tonsil, sometimes dramatic. I mean, this patient didn't really even have uh, crowding at the cervical medullary junction, but definitely had a Chiari uh, with the lumbar drain. So we did not, of course, do a Chiari decompression in this case. We removed the lumbar shunt. Uh, and the, let's see if we have it here, the Chiari uh, didn't improve all the way up to the, the pre, but it did come up significantly. And importantly, his sensitivity, uh, his need to be in the intensive care unit for any shunt problems and so forth, we also put an adjustable shunt in place, uh, decreased dramatically. And uh, here's a situation where both we see the sensitivity uh, that is, uh, that is acquired when you have a, a, a tight posterior fossa junction to changes in fluid pressure. We also see the, the next thing, which is not high pressures, but how low pressures uh, or a lumbar shunt can create a Chiari malformation. So low CSF pressures, shunts can of course either cause crowding, de novo, or certainly cause anatomical progression uh, of a Chiari uh, and result in symptoms. This is a, something that I would uh, years ago have said, oh, this is a, obviously a severe congenital uh, Chiari malformation. However, this is an acquired Chiari malformation from a lumbar shunt, and, and it was reversible with removal of the lumbar shunt. And this kind of teaches us that, uh, that Chiari uh, can be created by the things like CSF, uh, low pressures, leaks, and shunting. And it can be cured in some ways, or sometimes completely, uh, with removal of that uh, shunt. This is just to stress the point that anybody that comes into our, our office and our clinic for workup of, of uh, Chiari malformation, we have to think of all those things that, that Jeff pointed out, all those categories. Uh, we also must screen uh, for CSF disorders, uh, for overdrainage specifically as well. Sometimes that's quite obvious uh, to see. Uh, and sometimes it's quite difficult. And I want to spend a few minutes talking about spontaneous CSF leaks, which can occur without any major trauma and can sometimes be invisible on our standard imaging, but exist and have a profound role uh, on Chiari malformation uh, and uh, patient's uh, function. So this is a patient who came to, to us with a congenital hydrocephalus, had an old, old shunt in place, and you can see it up in here, Obviously, this, the ventricles are very well drained. They're small and slit. This shunt was put in about 15 years at least uh, earlier, uh, and we weren't even sure it was functioning. She didn't present with any symptoms of, of uh, intracranial pressure at all, however. Uh, she had no headaches, she had no feelings of pressure, no cognitive effects. Uh, but she did have pro thing, problems like swallowing deficit and diplopia, uh, and she did have some decreased exter extremity strength. She also came to us status post two Chiari decompressions. Uh, neither of those changed the course of, of what was happening for her. She got worse and weaker over time, and by the time I saw her, she went from being able to work to not even be able to get in the office or, or, or even stand up very much or, or walk. And so I, I have to say, the first thing I did was uh, something that I'm telling us not to do, and that is I thought about the Chiari primarily, and I put a cranioplasty plate on, thinking that, well, there's a very broad uh, Chiari uh, decompression, and we went ahead and uh, reconstructed the posterior fossa and, and, and put a plate on. Uh, that had no benefit whatsoever. Uh, she continued uh, to, to have weakness, problems in ambulation, uh, diplopia, swallowing difficulty. That really just slowly progressed over time. We consulted some of the colleagues, some of the ones that will be talking here uh, later as well, about the possibility of fusions and odontoid resections. I think you can see uh, that there is some prominence. Oh, I keep pointing over there. See, some prominence. an angulation anteriorly, uh, and you can see the severity of the Chiari malformation right here. So we were thinking really about that area because that's where her symptoms seem to be coming from. But then I had to remember that uh, Chiari can be a CSF disorder. And when we did test, I'm having, uh, this, uh, this new pointing system is not, I, it's, it's, it's doing the opposite thing. <laughs> I've, I've tried it. Thank you. 
Beautiful. So what we did was we basically said, okay, I don't think that there's any pressure problem up here, but I, geez, I've got to check the shunt. We did that and found that there was flow in the flow study. It was actually working. Uh, and when we did ICP measurements, cranial uh, ICP measurements, we saw essentially normal pressures, not high pressure, so the system wasn't working, but as was mentioned in a, in a case earlier today, uh, when she stood up and actually walked a little bit with assistance, uh, her pressures went very low, down to about uh, minus 11. So she indeed had a working shunt, no high pressures, but she had overdrainage. And what we found that after we corrected the overdrainage by putting in higher resistance devices, increasing the fluid a bit, this is the post compared to here, increasing the fluid throughout the, the lateral third and uh, in, into the fourth ventricle, that for the first time in all the time that I've known her and the Chiari decompressions, she started to improve. Now she hasn't improved completely yet and we're still watching how much improvement. And anatomically, there hasn't of course been a change in the herniation and some of the tightness down here. But symptomatically, for the first time, she's improved dramatically. And that came about, about by not just thinking about Chiari symptoms and treatment, but the pro progression of symptoms due to overdrainage. This is a uh, young woman who came to us asking if she could get pregnant. She had had several, um, she just had two Chiari decompressions previously uh, and years ago, and I asked her if the Chiari decompressions helped her at all. She said, not really, I still have bad headaches and neck pain, and even I have some episodes sometimes of some incontinence. Uh, and uh, we got this MRI when, when, when we saw her. Her history, as I said, two Chiari decompressions, and she also had a pituitary biopsy. And that was kind of interesting to me, and there was a little bit of a yellow flag at least going up, what's going on there. And we did a study with contrast, and we also saw a rim of contrast around the outside. So uh, this is a situation uh, in which uh, I think the, the whole course, including perhaps the Chiari decompressions and the pituitary biopsy, could have been avoided uh, if we thought about CSF disorders. Uh, when there is enhancement, as I'll show you another, in another cartoon later, when there is enhancement around here, when the pituitary gland is swollen, uh, that is often a sign of low pressure in the head, intracranial hypotension, and likely CSF leak. We did not do any cranioplasty. We did not uh, treat any, uh, or for, certainly any further decompression on her. Uh, but what we did do is do a, C a diagnostic CT myelogram, which showed CSF leaks in the spine, and she got patched, I think, at two levels. And her pictures, quite honestly, didn't change very much. Her, her enhancement did go down, but her symptoms got dramatically better, and, she, and her headaches uh, were greatly reduced. Uh, so uh, again, not only did it help her now, as opposed to just looking at the posterior fossa, by thinking about the CSF over drainage and the possibilities and doing a CT myelogram. Uh, but if this was done earlier, she might have avoided some of these decompressive surgeries uh, and, uh, and a pituitary biopsy. Brain sagging is something we see with CSF leaks, with overshunting, over drainage, uh, and with leaks that may be so small uh, that they aren't even recognized. Uh, here we see enhanced with the red is, is uh, meant to depict a swelling of the, uh, uh, of the uh, dura and meningeal enhancement. There's engorgement of the veins. There's enlargement of the pituitary gland. There's a general sagging of the brain, which is equivalent to the, the Chiari malformation here. You can also do measurements at the, uh, the front end of the, uh, of the uh, aqueduct to see if it's lower uh, than the, uh, the clivus uh, and the... Um, top of the tentorium. Uh, there's different measurements that are made here to see how much brain sagging there is. Well, she obviously, uh, this person, obviously, obviously has brain sagging manifest uh, by the Chiari malformation. Chiari malformation is one of the signs of brain sagging. There are other signs, as I mentioned, subdurals, dural enhancement, uh, engorgement of veins, and, and pituitary swelling, and sagging of the brain in the Chiari. However, the problem with these measures is that they're relatively low sensitivity. We can get this image, and I, I, I look at these pictures as a screening for any potential CSF uh, leak and low pressure in all, in all our patients coming to us with Chiari, but I have to realize that the sensitivity is quite low. Uh, we had a patient who came in a couple weeks ago who had a slightly enlarged pituitary gland uh, and uh, some, some questionable, I couldn't convince the radiologist that there was enhancement of the, uh, of the meninges. Well, uh, the headaches were somewhat positional, so we went ahead and did a CT myelogram. Uh, 
uh, and uh, they had a leak. And uh, we also measured intracranial pressure, which showed the leak, and he avoided a Chiari decompression. It's really important to rule out the CSF disorders. And this is a good screening with the images, but it isn't, uh, it isn't complete, certainly. You have to keep your level of suspicion pretty high because they can be uh, quite uh, subtle. Uh, exertional headaches at the end of the day, uh, and as you see, they can be even frontal headaches. Uh, and some of the patients, uh, something like 10 to 15 percent of the patients have no headaches whatsoever, whatsoever uh, no imaging signs. And if you measure their ICP with an LP, uh, one quarter of the time they'll be completely in the normal range. Uh, with spontaneous intracranial hypertension also, you can get other symptoms besides headaches, and there's quite a variety of symptoms which have been uh, uh, described. So this is a problem which is uh, hard to detect. It has different symptoms, and you need to just increase your level of suspicion uh, so you make sure you don't do a decompression and when you should be treating a CSF disorder. So to add to this, we'll say that, of course, CSF leaks can occur in a way that we, we can see, obviously, a person who's had surgical trauma, for example, surgery in the, in the lumbar or cervical region or wherever that, that creates a CSF leak or CSF oma, or it can occur uh, with, with a relatively minor trauma. And, of course, again, getting back to our theme of, of uh, of related disorders, many of our patients have connective tissue disorders. Now, this has been linked to Chiari in several other ways, that which may relate to cerv cervical uh, hyperflexibility, trauma, uh, angulation uh, of, of the uh, brainstem as well, that may be creating the, uh, uh, the brainstem deformation and symptoms. But I'm here just to remind us that, of course, a connective tissue disorder, and we've known this quite a while for disorders such as Marfan's disorder, but also for EDS, of course, that this kind of uh, uh, inherent weakness in connective tissues can increase uh, the risk both spontaneously uh, without known trauma or very minor trauma, the risk of CSF leaks. I should also mention we found very, uh, more and more in the, la in the last year, uh, patients who, who have chronic intracranial hypertension. Uh, these patients have pseudotumor cerebri, high pressure in the head, which is known over a long period of time can co even cause erosion and thinning of, of uh, connective tissue and bone. And some of these patients have outpouchings uh, in various areas uh, under the brain or in the spinal cord and have thinned areas. They're at high risk uh, for creating CSF leaks. So here you have a situation where high intracranial pressure uh, can cause a background uh, of pressure which causes thinning in CSF leaks. Uh, it becomes hard to detect because some of the high pressure disappears when, when there are leaks. You also recall the intracranial hypertension uh, can cause swelling of the brain and increased pressures uh, in the brain, which push down. So uh, there are several ways that uh, increased intracranial pressure uh, can result in, uh, in Chiari malformation and its symptoms. I'd like to, in the last few minutes, just mention something a little bit more experimental and something that we're looking at in terms of the dynamic uh, pulsation of the brain. And that is, is there anything inherent in crowding at the cervical medullary junction which can cause progression over time or cause symptoms over time? So as we all probably know, we heard just earlier, obviously the, the cardiac cycle uh, causes pulsations of waves of blood to hit uh, the, the closed cranium and increase intracranial pressure and movement with each beat of fluid from the head into the spinal canal and back. This makes this area where Chiari exists a critical area uh, for the exchange of fluid between the lower compliant spinal cord and the higher compliant skull. And it is this obstruction which is con of concerning uh, to, to some of us in terms of the uh, possible uh, disruption of normal uh, CSF uh, flow and pressure exchange uh, with every heartbeat. Here you see the cine flow that we all have been accustomed to looking at, uh, mostly in order to see if CSF flow can be a marker of crowding. If you don't see the flow going back and forth in this study, that perhaps it's crowded enough uh, to be of concern. Uh, that has limited value, I think, because often the anatomy tells us a great deal of that. The further questions which we wanted to address was, was there a role in brain movement? By movement, I don't just mean up and down, although we wanted to see that, but also uh, increased uh, descent of the tonsils. And, and might it be also playing a role in symptoms? I can't say we have the answer to these questions, symptoms and progression, but I wanted to show you how we do measure uh, movement. Uh, oh, if these videos don't play, then. Did it, start, did it start playing? Yeah. 
Hmm. Maybe, oh wait. Show certificate. Show certificate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It doesn't show up on your screen. It's moving there. So let me see if I can show a certificate quickly. It's, I don't even see the mouse. Um. Oh, there it is. Okay. Cancel. Yeah. Let's see if we can get there. Thank you. This one? Oh, we could. Oh, we have to play it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, the other one showed a dramatic increase. Yeah. Let me go back to this. Okay. And go back to that. And uh, let me go to play it. Here we go. Doesn't play. Oh, that's all right. Well, <laughs> suffice it to say that this is to show, as you've seen in some other sl slides previously, but a dramatic and what you would call a water hammer effect of the piston of the cerebellar tonsils coming down uh, and hitting the, uh, and, and deforming and hitting the uh, spinal cord in this area in a patient with Chiari. This is an intraoperative ultrasound. When we take uh, intraoperative ultrasound in many patients, we've all found, of course, that, that uh, if you saw that there, but the tonsils were there and they did not move very much. There's quite a variation uh, in patients with the same parent amount of herniation or crowding, some of them there's an active tonsil movement that hits against the spinal cord and some of them are, are relatively still. So we're, we're uh, in the process of looking to see the differences that occur in Chiari versus normal patients and, and uh, decompressed patients. Here's a patient, here's a uh, uh, illustration from MRI which may be a little bit clearer in terms of the uh, movement of the tonsils. This comes from uh, uh, my colleague Bryn Martin who's uh, an MRI specialist in this. And you can see, this is actually a video, but you can see there's not much movement here. I see, you see some pulsations down here. That's in a normal patient. So here's a patient, nice MRI uh, tissue-based uh, cine flow, which shows with every heartbeat, you can see the heart beating nicely there, obviously, uh, that there is downward movement. Why? Because the fluid that's up here, which would normally flow down with every heartbeat, cannot, and instead it pushes on the tissue. So you're in a situation where the tighter it is, the more the fluid pushes on this tissue downward, and the farther down it is, the more uh, the fluid can't get by freely. And you see with every heartbeat uh, that there's a potential for, for movement. Now our, our spinal cords uh, and nerves are, are meant to take, of course, a certain amount of motion and movement, uh, but the question is, uh, is, the, is the repeated movement, millions of movements uh, over time uh, taking a toll on uh, the tissue, is it stretching it out more and, and pushing it down? We've made measurements of other areas such as the pons and uh, the tonsils, and, it made, and I'll go really quickly here because I know we're running out, out of time, and compared pre and post uh, decompression. And we found basically that, uh, that there's more motion in tonsils in a Chiari patient, and it goes down when you do the decompression. And there's more motion associated the lower the tonsils are. Uh, which you might not expect, because if you see a lot of compaction of the tonsils, you might say that they're more constricted and would not move very much. Well, we found generally there was a correlation between lower tonsils uh, and motion, and also between the pressure differential and tonsil movement. So, how, what is the significance of this movement? Well, again, the additive effect of millions of repetitions, uh, additive deformation, depending on the variability and plasticity and elasticity of that tissue, uh, which may relate back to connective tissue issues. And a positive feedback loop, as I mentioned. As the tonsils go down, uh, they, there's more force on them uh, by the uh, pulsatile fluid. And if you add this to the other issues uh, of fluid imbalance, whether it be a, a CSF leak or hydrocephalus or just general hyperpulsatility, uh, we think that this, this is something that uh, is worthwhile studying as a possible additional uh, pathophysiology of the tonsils induced by dynamic movement of CSF. So we've gone from a, a simple one-line diagram in the beginning of this talk to, to be thinking about a whole set of ways that a Chiari malformation uh, can evolve and, and produce symptoms. And we haven't even, of course, talked about mechanisms of, of symptom development uh, very much. But obviously it's quite complex, but we get to get a, a sort of a map of what we can study and what we can consider. And in blue here you see the many ways
uh, that CSF uh, and its movement is involved with uh, the development and uh, perhaps the pathophysiology of, uh, of Chiari. What's the point, finally? Uh, other factors are involved, like CSF movement. We need to watch for high CSF pressures in the pushing. Uh, we need to watch for CSF pressures uh, that are low and pulling down on the uh, cerebellar tonsils uh, and the brainstem. And uh, this can be done, and I didn't obviously go into it, but with various uh, studies which are not so sensitive, but are more sensitive than just looking at MRIs, like delayed uh, uh, CT uh, myelograms, MRI myelograms, and uh, dynamic and subtraction studies. And we need to patch leaks first and then verify that we've normalized the pressures. And in many cases, a decompression may not be needed. And the goal of decompression, of course, is not only to decompress the tissue, but to equalize fluid pressures and allow movement and pulsation at the cervical medullary junction. Thank you very much.